Hey everyone, uh, welcome to EA Zoom meetings. I'm Sarah Peterson, your host for this presentation. And this time around, we're going to be covering the houses and angles. Um, and uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a guidance counselor, an intuitive guidance counselor, an astrologer, psychic. I wear many hats. I also teach psychic intuitive development and astrology, the foundations of astrology. And this here, um, this talk is very foundational. Um, though we'll be talking about, um, about this uh, topic in some ways from an evolutionary perspective, from a philosophical perspective, it's not um, I just want to be clear, it's not traditional EA, evolutionary astrology, as taught by Jeffrey Wolf Green. This is more um, based on what I've learned up until this point, and um, I'm taking that from evolutionary astrology, from modern astrology, a little bit of traditional astrology, and everything in between. Um, so this talk will be great for anyone who is an astrologer, who wants to um, maybe learn some tips and tricks to help strengthen their foundational understanding of how astrology works, and it will also be useful to anyone who is interested in astrology for other reasons as well. So yeah, that's literally it right here. Um, just sharing some techniques that I've learned throughout my journey as an astrologer and as a student of astrology that I've found um, have really helped me to see, uh, I guess, I mean, because astrology is so multidimensional, there's so many different ways we can approach how we read a chart, and um, and so many of these approaches really complement each other. And I've come up with some techniques uh, through learning and on my own that I feel will be useful to anyone who's interested. Um, and yeah, um, and again, it's you know we there, again there's so many things we can talk about when it comes to astrology, and it can get super esoteric, super advanced. But it's so important to have a strong foundation for, uh, from which to, to build our understanding of astrology from. So I'm covering this topic because um, as basic as houses and angles can appear, uh, especially if you've, you're an astrologer and have been for a long time, um, it's really important you know, to just make sure that we know as much as possible, or at least that's the way I see things. If we can know as much as possible about the foundational basics, then it just makes us better astrologers, right? Um, so here's what I'll be covering in this presentation. So why the houses are so important. Um, the procession of houses and signs, so we'll be going from Aries all the way around Pisces. And we'll be talking about the quadrants. I don't think I added that in here. So we'll be talking about touching on that, the importance of the quadrants and in, in, uh, delineating and interpreting charts, um, how angular, succedent, and cadent houses function and how they work together. Um, and again, I said the procession of houses. Why did I put that in twice? I have no idea. <laughs> um, reconciling the challenges presented in, in uh on a chart when we see planets and signs uh, falling into incompatible houses. So like if you have say a cardinal planet uh, or cardinal sign, you know, planet showing up in a fixed house, how's that going to play out? What are the challenges and the pros and cons there? Or say um, a mutable uh, sign in a planet showing up in a cardinal house, like what would happen there and what kind of challenges could a person experience? So, or, or even benefits. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. And, um, you know, time permitting, I've got a couple example charts. I've got my own natal chart because I, I, I think all astrologers, or at least I, I, I'm under the assumption <laughs> that most astrologers are pretty obsessed with their own charts. I think we can learn so much by studying ourselves. And part of my work, even as a counselor, one of the foundational pieces that I teach to people is for us to know how the, the nature of the universe functions and how even the world we live in operates. The more we go inside and learn about ourselves, the more clear the world becomes to us. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm going to be going through my chart a little bit just to show you because I've got all sorts of, I guess you could say, incompatible planetary placements. Um, and uh, I also have the natal chart for Canada. Uh, which I thought was an interesting one. So we'll look at that one just because then we can look at it, um, maybe this whole house and placement situation scenario from the perspective of mundane astrology, which is um, astrology of, of nations and things like that. All right. 
And I, I had to put this meme in here <laughs> because like the thing is, is houses are important because we can look at a chart. We could cast a chart without a birth time. Um, and some people will do a noon chart, which is when you take the sun of the native, um, the chart, the, the chart native and put it at the mid heaven. Right. Or you can do um, a solar chart, which is where and not a solar return. I want to be clear on that, where you take the sun and you put it right on the ascendant and we can cast charts that way. And it's really useful if you don't have an accurate birth time. But if you are ravenous to know all there is to know about a person through the lens of astrology, it's so useful to have a birth time because then we can look at the houses and that just blows a chart up so much we have so much to look at we can see not just a planet in its sign and understand the flavor and function of that we can put that planet in sign and understand the arena of life um, or evolution or interaction with the world we can see how that planet is playing out not only in the flavor of the sign but in those arenas of existence here on the planet right which is huge um, like for instance here, um, I mentioned seventh, the seventh house. If we have planets in the seventh house, um, knowing the birth time, we can see, oh, we've got Venus in the seventh house. So we can look at maybe the blind spots of that Venus, maybe where there's projection going on through that Venus or sun or any other planet or asteroid, right? Or even th theoretical points, like I mentioned here, um, I get so excited when I see that someone has an accurate birth time and I know it's like, you know, based on a hospital record or something like that, because we know for sure, at least as much as we can, um, just how, how uh, we can really get very detailed and precise as far as how we're reading our chart. We can look at, um, and they've got a lot of acronyms down here um, at the bottom, but BML is we can look at Black Moon Lilith, which is a theoretical point that we would need an accurate birth time to read. Uh, White Moon Selena is the next one. Um, and of course, the very, very important um, angles, they're critical because um, most astrologers will agree card the cardinal angles and cardinal points in a chart are, are quite important. Um, I, I say that all points are important, but the cardinal points are exceedingly important. Our ascendant, our midheaven, um, our IC, uh, or... Imam Kolai, I never pronounce that right. And um, of course, the midheaven descendant. Yeah, I just want to make sure I said them all. Ascendant, midheaven, <laughs> I see, and descendant. Those are four cardinal points that show us how we're approaching uh, the world, our inner world, um, our our blind spots, other people, and even um, the world stage. We could say, right? He key parts of, of existence here on this planet as a human being. So, yeah. Um, oh, Sarah? And, yes? Uh, what is White Moon Selena about? I haven't heard of that one before. <clears throat> oh, White Moon Selena. Okay, so um, as far as the calculation goes, I'm a little unclear on exactly how to calculate it, but it's almost, we could call it the antithesis to Black Moon Lilith. She's more... Like uh, where Black Moon Lilith is our instinctual, um, we could say unbridled wild side from the feminine, like dark feminine um, perspective. White Moon Lilith is like our lightest, most, um, we could say, how could I put it? I don't want to say good, but it's almost like our most altruistic and, and um, the altruistic feminine. So we have Lilith, we could say, is the dark feminine and White Moon Selena. Uh, which is like the opposite end, if we were to do the mathematical calculation, as far as I know, um, I believe Black Moon Lilith is the furthest away from the moon during that from that calculation, and White Moon Selena is the closest. And she's considered, we would say, yeah, like the light feminine or the, or the um, yeah, the light feminine. So it shows really our, our goodness from the feminine perspective, from that feminine energetic perspective. And um, it's really quite an interesting one to, um, to look into uh, if anyone's interested in learning that I would highly suggest it because it, it shows ba it helps balance I feel Black Moon Lilith's energy if we're looking oh. at both. Okay thank you very interesting thank you. Yeah you're welcome yeah and uh, um, and yeah and there's other points we can look at as well um, that are of course the moon with an accurate birth time I mean you know we get to look at the moon too um, so 
yeah, and it, uh, <laughs> this meme here, this guy here, he's exhibit. This is such an obscure meme that I'm sure most people, unless you watch MTV, and I don't know who does that anymore, but uh, there was a show called Pimp My Ride, and he would always take someone's car and over embellish everything they liked. So he'd be like, yo, dog, I heard you like diamonds, so I decided to encrust your entire car in diamonds. <laughs> and so in this here, I just... I see with an accurate birth time, we don't just get to look at houses, we get to go into like this infinite scope of awareness into a person. It really can become, um, we could study our, a, a chart for an entire lifetime and more, right? And so for info junkies, it's it's a great thing. I, I love that. So um, I decided to look at a few ways. There's so many ways to interpret the houses you know, um, and these are some ways, this one here, and I have another one I wanted to go through that can be really useful, I feel, uh, to kind of see the procession of moving from one house through to the next, through to the next, through to the next, all the way to Pisces. And the reason why is because I feel it's important to understand that although we have work to do on all, in all of our houses, regardless of whether or not there's a planet in there or, or any kind of body in there, I feel that it's important to respect that we're, we live in a cyclical reality, I guess you could say. And so we're always starting from Aries and moving our way through to Pisces. And, oh man, that allegory could be applied in so many facets of our life and our existence, you know? <clears throat> Even from something like learning how to play an instrument. We're going to start with a beginner's mindset from Aries, you know? We're going to um, to go through that in such a way where we could actually apply all of the zodiac signs as we go through. Um, and so here uh, we start with Aries. So in life, we're interfacing, you know, the first, like as soon as we start in life, we're interfacing with life head on. Um, we're not entirely conscious of it, which is very much like Aries because Aries is, um, you know, there's many instinctual and intuitive planets, but Aries runs on a kind of instinctual intuition that doesn't quite think. It just does it, you know? And so we always approach pretty much anything in life from that flavor of Aries. And um, whatever planets are placed in there are going to show the flavor of how we're exerting that Aries or first house um, energy, in a sense. And then next is the succeedant sign or house. Uh, of Taurus or the second house and of course depending on whatever chart you're looking at your second house cusp or the second house cusp with that chart isn't necessarily going to be Taurus it could be something else depending on what the ascendant is placed in but um, it's always going to have at the foundation of it a Taurian flavor and that's going to be true for any house that shows up in a chart right um, regardless of the sign that's on the cusp um, it's always foundationally going to have the um, energy of the um, as of the signs in procession here, like Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo for the sixth house. Um, and so, yeah, Taurus stabilizing through awareness of sensual and body, bodily needs. So we come into life first in Aries, right? We're interfacing, but then next we become aware of our body and its needs like hunger, thirst, needing to be warm, cu uh, cuddled, you know, our sensual needs. Um, and, uh, and then next comes into adapting into the immediate environment mentally and verbally because we're going to want to communicate, of course, right? If we need a blanket, how are we going to tell anyone we need a blanket? <laughs> or if we're hungry, how are we going to tell people we're hungry? We need to use our voice, right? So it stands to reason that next is Gemini and then Cancer, which, see, We'll notice, uh, and I'll talk a bit about this more, but we have Aries, Angular, Taurus, Succedent, and Gemini, Cadent, and then it goes back to Angular again. So we're going into the next quadrant, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. Um, Cancer is Angular, and it's interfacing, just like Aries, interfacing, right? Interfacing with the homeland. So one's emotional landscape as well. Homeland, family, our emotional landscape. Homeland and family, now... I, I'm sure other people could describe this probably more succinctly, but I can only assume that emotional security and our emotional landscape are synonymous with family because they're more or less, whether they're our biological family or blood family, whoever it is that we're, that we're growing up around, our, our tribe, you could say, um, they're going to influence 
our emotional st uh, stability and emotional awareness on, on deep fundamental levels. Um, I believe it is from birth until the age of seven that we're largely in a subconscious state of, of being. We're not really thinking as critically as when we get a little bit older and develop. So we're absorbing everything in our environment, right? Um, so, so yeah, there's, uh, there is that. I hope that explains that there. And, and then next we go into the succeedant Leo house or fifth house, which is stabilizing. So we see we go in from the cancer house or, or the fourth house into a Leo house, which helps us after we've kind of identified or interfaced with our family and identified our emotional um, un awareness and understanding on some level, whether or not we're even consciously identifying it or not, moving into the Leo house, we're stabilizing that. Succeed in houses are stabilizers, right? They stabilize the cardinal so that the cardinal um, can, can sustain itself, really, because cardinal energy, although it does always want to move forward and keep going, it can run out of steam, right? It needs something to keep it stable. And so Leo, uh, in this case here, is stabilizing us through our sense of self, and it also relates uh, to the immediate environment as well, as, sorry, as it relates to the immediate environment. So stabilizing of our sense of self as we're relating to our family, our neighborhood, right, in Gemini our brothers and sisters, our family, our kin. It all leads into each other. And then next after that is a cadent house. Cadent is also synonymous with mutable, the term mutable, right? Um, and so we're adapting. Cadent houses are about adapting, very much so, right? Um, because, well, fixed, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, about this a bit more because I have another slide later on that goes into this in more detail. But um, succeedant, of course, right, stagnance and inertia can be a thing when it comes to fixed or succeedant energy. And so it's important for us to have the ability to adapt and mutate, we could say, right, um, in order to continue growing and evolving. And so in the sixth house, we've got adapting to daily tasks and challenges of the challenges of daily life through our work and our service. And even regardless of what age you are, um, this is going to be true even as kids we you know we learn to do chores or we learn how to serve our family or our community in whatever way that um that we fit we find ourselves fitting in right or even how we're told to um and and in the case of virgo because uh, virgo is not necessarily um but we won't we won't get too much into that i, I might talk about that in a bit so next from Virgo, um, at that end of that cycle there, with the cadent house of, of the sixth house, Virgo energy, we go into the seventh, which is Libra, and that's an angular house, so it's a new beginning, and it's showing us that we're not an island, right? Because this too, when we're looking at a chart, this is now showing the northern hemisphere of the chart, where we're living more in the outside world, right? And so we're learning, oh wow, there's other people. And so we're learning how to interface with others in a way where, um, we want to hear hear them. We want to relate to them. We want them to like us, and we want to um, want them to get us stuff, <laughs> to do stuff for us. Uh, it's sort of a Libra thing, right? Um, my mentor used to say the Libra house has sort of got this like, um, well, it's very feminine, even though it's an air sign. So technically, it's masculine, but I feel it's um, because it is ruled by Venus. Of course, there's that hermaphroditic kind of a sense to Libra. In a, in a way, right? So on one hand, while it's an air sign and masculine, there's also this uh, feminine a femininity, this beauty, this allure, and also the diplomacy, we could say, the ability to kind of talk people around to our way of thinking, or, you know, that type of a thing. Um, so moving from that, now we're interacting with others, but we need to kind of stabilize that energy, right? So that we can sustain relationships, keep things balanced. And uh, that moves into Scorpio, which, is a planet or a sign of extremes, and the eighth house is very much a house that uh, shows us how we're interfacing in, in even deeper levels than the air sign or the air house of the seventh house, the Libra house, right? We're learning to see people more deeply. We're learning to um, evolve ourselves to grow up, to see maybe where we're, where our, um, less desirable traits are and the less desirable traits in others we see where people are lying or betraying each other um where we're being betrayed or betraying others you know and for the sincere 
initiates and seekers out there, this is also a house that shows us the opportunity to really stabilize um, our understanding of the fact that others do exist through transmutation of our evil, we could say. Um, and then moving into that, of course, is a cadent house, which is going to be adapting to, to that information that we received in the preceding houses by communicating with, we'll say God, and I'm using air quotes because people use many different terms for God, right? It could be mind, source, all, creator, um, but we're, we're starting to interface and communicate with God and we're starting to take in information from other places and we're learning how to see the bigger picture, but not, not in the way that the 10th and 11th and 12th houses see the bigger picture. It's more about the quest for truth and communicating with um, natural law and, and learning like basic laws like cause and effect. You know, like when I betray someone, like in the Scorpio house, or if I lie to someone, say the Libra house, in those two houses, you know, um, there's going to be a consequence to my behavior. And we learn how to understand that I feel um, through a sincere endeavor to understand natural law, which comes through the ninth house. And we will um, learn these things in a variety of ways, because the ninth house also talks about traveling to other lands, to quote unquote, foreign lands, uh, learning, you know, languages uh, from foreign people and ways of life from foreign people, foreign cultures, philosophy, higher truths, right? But it doesn't end there. The cycle doesn't quite end there yet. We're, we're ready to, to go into a new beginning, you know, now that we've had, we've educated ourselves, we're ready to take that even further. And the Capricorn house, the 10th house, is imperative to that because this is now um, where we are on the world stage. This is, this is the point in our life where we're taking our information and uh, it's I, now part of the 10th house and the 11th house, I believe, are the disseminating phase, if I'm correct, when we're looking at phasal relationships. And so it really is still about climbing to a point of mastery, but it's also um, using, this house is very much about um, our, our time to, how do I say this? to see our responsibility and that it's, uh, again, it's another house that shows us as we progress through these houses, starting at Aries, we think it's all about us, but now we're really seeing it's, it's about doing the right thing from, we could say a Saturnian or father-like perspective where we need to care for the young ones. And I'm using a lot of air quotes today <laughs> because they don't necessarily have to be chronologically younger than us, but people who need our wisdom, people who need our guidance, you know, this house really shows that. And also, it's a house of building resiliency because it's a very realistic house. It's based in planet Earth. And, um, you know, we've got houses that are more etheric, like Pisces, um, but Capricorn's very much about the cold, hard truth. And it's about what needs to be done in the physical plane to uh, um, so that we can manifest what it is we're desiring to manifest. And that could be learning how to play the flute. That could be... Uh, making a bajillion dollars that could be um, becoming a, a, an excellent parent. You know, there's, there's a variety of ways that this could be iterated depending on the individual and what their, um, what their uh, goals are in life, right? What they're trying to actualize in life. Um, and we do learn in, in the 10th house very much about the way the world works and our place in it. But we can get stuck in a rut and become, now Sagittarius can be seen as dogmatic, but definitely a Capricorn house, 10th house shows us also too, where there's um, zealousness, we could say, um, and a very unyielding, you know, square-like number four earth energy that doesn't want to, to bend once it already thinks it knows how things work, thinks it knows the rules. And that's where we need that stabilizer of the 11th house, right? Um, because we want to make sure that our responsibilities that are depicted in the 10th house are being supported by an open mind that sees the whole of humanity. And so um, it's an air sign, so it's not maybe as stable as, say, a Taurus house, right, which is more earth-based, but we do need to have a stable mind that is aware of the whole of humanity. And so the 11th house shows us that, and it also shows us where we can disseminate um, the information that we've gleaned from our 10th house experience uh, by sharing it with the group, 
And that could be um, our local community, uh, that could be our country, that could be our cult, <laughs> you know, or it could even be the chess club that we belong to. I mean, there's, you know, we can look at that from a number of, of, of facets, um, but we're disseminating what we've learned and we're sharing that with the group. And we're sharing ideas, you know, maybe ideas that are a little more, well, when we look at earth, right, Capricorn 10th house, earth element, and we look at air, like they're basically, they're not really the antithesis of each other, but they're so far and away from each other, it's hard for them to understand or communicate a lot of the time. So it makes sense that an angular house like the 10th house would need a succeedant house like a fixed air uh, Aquarian 11th house to help open its mind and get it to think of more, um, think more of, of more, of seeing new ways to, to live outside of the box and to innovate and to continue to evolve. Otherwise, we could become stagnant. So it's kind of interesting that this succeedant house, a fixed house, could actually break us out of our complacency so that we can continue to grow and innovate new ways to improve humanity, culture, technology, and even the quality of life for all people, right? Um, although there are, we can look at the extreme and see a, 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 the Aquarius house becoming um, a house where it's more about exclusivity because traditionally ruled by Saturn, yes, it is ruled by Uranus as well, so it is about breaking through um, stagnation, but there is that Saturn shadow there, right? So we have to be careful about um, Capricorn and Aquarius getting together and becoming a country club that won't let the undesirables in, if you know what I'm saying, right? So these two houses, uh, yeah, it's we're starting to see when we look at the 10th, 11th, and 12th houses, how much, how how much bigger the world is becoming in this cycle, this progression. We're seeing that that we have responsibilities to not just us, right? Um, we're looking at the bigger picture, but if we stay stuck and say an Aries Taurus Gemini, and I'm not, and of course I'm talking about the energy, right? Um, kind of a mode where it's very self-focused, self-oriented. Um, it can be quite dangerous if we get to the end of this cycle here in Capricorn Aquarius Pisces, um, because you know if we're not looking at the whole or being humble or sincere in our endeavor to know the truth or to know God, we can become quite uh, insulated and about us only or about only our people, right? Um, and so, yeah, and ideally, an 11th, the 11th host will show us actually how we can break out of that and share with the entire world our kooky ideas or our amazing, amazing, brilliant ideas and innovate, right? And evolve. And of course, now moving into the 12th house, it's important to know too that all things come to an end, right? Nothing lasts forever, as it says here. So we identify with sometimes the futility of our situation. You know, as humans, I think a, there's, there's a significant portion of us who want to see wonderful things happening in the world. We want to see world peace. We want to see an end to hunger, an end to poverty. Um, we want scarcity to go away, and we want everyone to be able to have the freedom to live however they like. But Pisces shows us, in a sense, sometimes we only have so much time in a cycle. There's only so much we can do in a given cycle. And so we might become identified with suffering or the futility of our situation, or at least our impact on it. We might see, come to realize, you know, the bigger picture beyond the mundane to the point where we're seeing that we're actually quite insignificant, right? Um, and there can be a disillusionment that comes through that. But at the same time, we can come to accept that nothing lasts forever and that we can still do our best. We can still show compassion and even um, sacrifice, you know, for the greater good. But in a way, of course, we, we want to be balanced. That isn't martyring. So the 12th house shows us, uh, depending on whatever pla planets are placed in there, um, these arenas of life. And of course, there's so many ways we can read houses. So these are just, you know, just one neat way. And if you're sick of this slide, guess what? <laughs> Here's another one, the exact same thing. It's not really the exact same thing, <laughs> but it's just another angle, and I'm not going to take as long with this one because I've got more to share. But um, this one here, I kind of like looking at the procession of houses as like um, developmental stages, right? So if we're looking at the first, second, and third houses, Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, we can see those as infancy, right? Um, and 
The reason why I say this is because these are houses, and I'll go more into this when I look in the quadrants, but these are, these are self-aware houses. They're more about building self-awareness in a variety of ways, from, from um, a fire elemental wave, um, earth, and, and air. Uh, you know, but it's so like, what do I have here? Yeah, Aries is like pre-awareness, right? It's not about thinking. It's about learning how to, and I just want to be clear. When I say this, I don't want to say that an Aries person is automatically going to be less mature than, say, an Aquarius person. But it's what their focus of life and whatever planets are falling in these houses, these are the focuses that um, that we need to develop because we need at all signs. We need we need to be focusing on all of our houses, right? So these first three houses are are more infancy in a sense. Uh, Pre awareness. Aries Aries houses want us to teach or want us to learn how to live on instinct, to trust our instincts, to trust our ability to act without necessarily needing to think about it too much. In fact, I would dare say Aries doesn't want to think, period. It just wants to do it, right? It just wants to do it. Next, um, in Taurus is, you know, awareness of our body, awareness of our needs, awareness of what matters to us, you know, earth element, what matters, what has meaning to us. Um, and so it's our physical needs. And of course, um, our need to communicate in the third house, right? So these are, um, that would be the first quadrant. Second is uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth, which moves into the next stage of life. We're getting a little bit older now. We're in the childhood stage. So, uh, you know, as, we, as we're developing our ability to communicate, we start identifying with our family, identifying with our nation and with our clan, right? I'm a, I'm a Johnson. I'm a Miyamoto. I'm a, you know, um, I don't know, American, Canadian, Dutch person. We start identifying with that. Um, and the next is the identification with our ego and sexuality, right? Um, as it pertains to our immediate environment, because we're still not quite out there in the world yet in the Southern Hemisphere of the chart, yeah? Um, and so Leo, uh, I, I do add sexuality here. Of course, the fifth house is very much a house of both sex. Um, and I do believe when you've got planets placed in the fifth house, your sexuality tends to develop a little bit earlier than other, other houses. Um, having myself having Venus in the fifth house and, and looking at other charts that have had Venus or Mars, for instance, more so than uh, like, I wouldn't necessarily say Mercury or the moon, maybe the moon, depending on what sign it is, but definitely the primal instinct houses like Mars and Venus being placed in the fifth house, sexuality is going to develop earlier in life, uh, for sure. And so we start identifying with that a little bit, you know, that level. Like um, maybe a boy who becomes very interested in, in understanding women or girls, you know, at that age and vice versa. Um, and then next third stage of childhood development being in Virgo house. And now we're getting at a point where we're kind of in the tween section. So we're not, we're kind of like not quite a teenager, not quite a youth yet, right, in this cadent house. So we start identifying with our station in society. We start understanding that um, we're a rich kid, a poor kid, we're a baker's daughter, we're a priest's or um, a pastor's son, you know, these kinds of things. We start realizing what the implications of that is in the world sphere and society. And so we start identifying with either our adequacy or an inadequacy as far as that goes, being that the sixth house is where we're not always the most confident, you could say. Next, we move on to, we're starting to grow up a little bit in our first stage of youth, right? Uh, so now we could look at this more as, and now when I say this, this is of course allegorical, right? Um, when I'm talking about the ages. So first stage youth is awareness of the necessity of others in partnership. It's when we maybe um, start looking at wanting to, we could say date, and then the eighth house being um, awareness of power dynamics and relationships, the implications of getting into a relationship with others. And more often than not, a lot of the time we start learning about corruption, about manipulation, about the alchemical process when we are getting into deeper, more intimate and bonded relationships with people. And so the eighth house can show us very much about that depending on what's placed in there. Um, 
third stage youth uh, would be learning again this is we're ready to go to college we're in college we're learning higher truths we're expanding our knowledge through education and travel and getting to know um, people from again foreign lands we will say and awareness of natural law creator higher truths philosophy and then we become adults um, or something of the sort in the first stage of adulthood where we're realizing societal cultural expectations we're realizing oh man i gotta vote now you know i'm old enough to smoke <laughs> and vote and get a job and pay taxes and these other other burdens and also not just that but we become aware too of what it is we're attempting to build in life right what's the pinnacle we're attempting to reach all of that shown in the, in the 10th house 11th of course too um, it, we're, you know, we're starting to get older and older and older here. And so we're again identifying, like I was saying, identifying with the community, with our traumas as a collective, right? Or the group's traumas, even we could say, our hopes and ideals for our, our group and our communities. And then the third stage of adulthood is towards the end of life. So acceptance of our imminent demise, the end of a cycle, the imminent end of a cycle, preparing for growth into a new form. You know, people will say we're preparing for our, our journey to the afterlife or something of the sort. Um, and so we're ready to kind of release everything that we've built up from the beginning, being Aries, so that we can start all over again into a whole new cycle starting at Aries again. Um, and so I just want to pause here and see, does anyone want to interject with a comment or question or anything at all? Uh, please do, if you have anything to say. Alrighty, and if you do have anything you want to say, um, and I've skipped past you, please feel free to jump in. Um, you know, any any contribution to the conversation is welcomed. I just want to reiterate that. So, yeah, um, I was looking around on the internet because I wanted to get some more information on the angular houses to share with everyone, and I found a, this pretty interesting because, of course, there's always you're always going to find truth, you know, somewhere, but it's important to see where the truth isn't as well. And so in this piece here, we've got um, some information from William Lilly, which is a venerated astrologer, traditional astrologer from the 17th century. And, you know, uh, well, what do I have here? The angular houses of the horoscope are considered to be the most ardent or forceful and are considered to have the greatest impact on the chart. The influential 17th century astrologer William Lilly st states simply, planets and angles do more forcibly show their effects. Angular houses rule those critical things in our lives, such as our appearance and how we behave, our family life, our married life, or partnerships in our career. And all of that's true, of course, right? Um, but as you'll see as I go on, it also there's a lot of implying that the angular houses are the most important. And while they're incredibly important, I, I feel that um, a lot of weight is given to them as if they're more important to other houses. Um, and so let's move on and I'll get to that. Succeedant houses. Um, so these houses are subsequent from, and that means just like following, from the angular houses, and there's a typo there, and thus provide a, um, they provide fertile ground for the essence of the angular houses to take root in. Succeeding houses provide the stability and staying power to complement the forces expressed by way of the angular houses. And so traditionally, they are seen less powerful than angular houses um, because, you know, they're not, I guess we're saying they're not providing the impetus or the spark that we're seeing, the action that we're seeing played out in the first houses. Um, they're more about stabilizing or following the actions that are that are being expressed through the first house or not first house but through the angular houses but uh, again it's important to understand the overall importance to like all of the houses because if we want to function ideally we can't put too much weight into like even if you have now of course it's going to be a little skewed just say you have a a stellium in your first house and it's like it's got your sun and your mercury and your venus and let's just throw your mars in there too that's a lot of personal planets in your first house right so of course there's going to be quite a lot of focus on there in your life because you have so many planets playing through that arena of the first house but 
it's important to understand too for the ideal functioning of those planets we need to identify and acknowledge the requirements and the necessities of the other houses as well right because um it's all about balance and equilibrium yeah and so it's it's definitely important just to look at the whole of the chart as much as we can even if it's tempting to focus on one area because we're seeing a lot of focus in that part of our chart we want to look at everything so we can unlock all of the treasure of knowledge that is there to help us really come to know ourselves as thoroughly as possible and so yeah cadent houses third sixth ninth and twelfth and so these are these houses get probably the worst rap, at least in traditional astrology. Um, as you'll see here, these houses are the houses that shift or are quote unquote falling into the next quadrant of houses. Planets placed here are seen as weak, less fertile, and these this is coming from traditional astrology more, more so. They're seen as less fertile, less productive, or in decline, according to ancient astrologers, and they were the uh, as they were the furthest away from the angular house that preceded it. So, of course, you know, as it says there, it's pretty clear, I'm inclined to disagree because within cycles, um, these houses, these cadent houses, I feel are the harbingers of new cycles. So without cadent houses and, and planets, you know, placed in there deserve this acknowledgement, um, without cadent houses, it would be impossible for us to adapt into the, the houses that follow, you know? Um, and the reason why is because we want to look at, at everything like a constant cycle. There's no beginning and no end. And this is why people can't figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg. Like what came first, the Big Bang or the, the uh, universal womb, right? Like it's, it's kind of hard to know that, at least at our point in development. Um, so it's good to just see everything equally, I feel. And of course, do what you will, but it makes sense to me. So um, this is just something I wanted to throw in that I learned that is a neat trick if you're ever wanting to understand how these energies kind of respond or interact with each other. So it's like a rock, paper, scissors game. And of course, when I say beat, you'll notice I've written quotes because nothing really is better or superior. It's just that we see how these energies are kind of, um, I guess you could say, hmm, well, I'll explain it this way. So... Why does an angular house beat a succedent house? Well, it's like I was actually saying earlier. Let's just say this is a succedent house, even though, well, we'll do this because, you know, the graphic on the screen. Succedent is paper, right? But it will just stay paper, and it won't necessarily move unless it's got something kind of pushing it, right? Like it's like unstoppable force versus an immovable object now but in this case the unstoppable force will eventually move that object get it to move if it keeps being persistent now mutable can become dissolved and and distracted and lose its way like um gemini virgo pisces sag we all know that these kinds of energies um if if they're not balanced and focused they can definitely disintegrate in a sense right i can think of virgo almost like quicksand it's just you know, it just, it, it's just, it can't, it can't necessarily keep its form, which can be useful, but sometimes if we need to keep focused and galvanized to, to meet an end, it can, it can uh, cause trouble. So fixed helps if we see it as a receptacle to hold that energy of mutable. So it has a, a place to kind of do its thing and move around and be mutable, but it has a cup to hold it in. So it's a stabilizer we can see it as. And um, cadent beats, quote unquote, cardinal, because cardinal always wants to move forward, but is forward always the best way to go? We want to learn how to adapt. And so mutable can really confound cardinal and kind of get it to realize that even though it's not as quickly able to adapt as, as a cadent or mutable energy, it can help confound, we could say, cardinal energy enough to get it to slowly move its direction and take a new angle. So I hope that is useful to people. And uh, I realize I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to go a little bit more quickly here. Um, again, like I was saying, uh, it's always a good idea. Now, of course, we can jump houses, like it says here, um, and we can say if we just Chart, uh, drafted up a chart we can focus on the stellium of planets in the 11th house that show up hypothetically let's say but um it's always good i feel for understanding a person place or thing in a chart to start at aries and move our way around you know and of course like 
whatever order you want to do things in when you're starting out, cool. But at some point, I think it's important to at least look at the chart from Aries and then work your way around. And, and, and I guess you could say follow that journey and, and glean what you can from how Aries is moving into Taurus, is moving into Gemini, and then moving into the next quadrant, and the next and the next, right? Um, so let's see, I uh, wanted to talk real briefly about the quadrants here for anyone who would like to know more about that. So yeah, um, quadrant one is awareness of the self. Like I was saying earlier, it's a little bit more about our infancy. We're learning about ourselves before we learn about our environment, right? And so uh, what we learn in childhood isn't always congruent with nature, though, in this world that we live in and our, communi our values and our communication style as well. So more often than not, like it says here in this, uh, this, this uh, sorry, the state of consensus being what it is, which is vastly out of touch with natural law. Um, we might suffer from a lack of awareness of these foundational facets of our expression and our interaction and our being, which is why it's so good that even if you don't necessarily have planets in this quadrant, to examine the house cusps and then the rulers of those cusps, right? Uh, to get to understand a bit more about how and why, uh, how these, these uh, facets function and why they do. And, um, and it will help you to just understand even more about yourself than just examining the planets, right? So next we got quadrant two, integrating with the immediate environment. So that's, again, that's Cancer, Leo, and Virgo, fourth, fifth, and sixth houses. And here we, uh, we identify, um, or we see how we identify with regard to our family, our homeland, and how that impacts our sense of emotional fortitude, fifth house, right? Or, I'm sorry, fourth house, which feeds into how we identify sexually or creatively, um, fifth house, which in turn will help us to see ourselves in relation to others from a societal cultural standpoint or a social cultural standpoint. So as I was saying, it doesn't really matter how many planets you have here or not or don't. Um, it's always good to look at this and look at the house cusp rulers as well. So for instance, in this chart, it's just a basic chart, we would look at the sixth house if we want to understand how we see ourselves in relation to others from a social st cultural standpoint. And this is, you know, this one here is ruled by Virgo. This may differ based on whatever chart you're looking at. So we'd want to find out where Mercury is. Where is Mercury placed? And we look at that house. And if we want to go even deeper, we can look at that, how um, the ruler of that house um, as well. Quadrant three, awareness and interaction with others. So we can see how the first and second quadrant um, affect the way that we interface and relate with others, and in turn, how we behave and respond to power dynamics here in this house, right? Um, and how we are um, understanding how we interact with foreign peoples. Um, we learn the implications, too, of our actions, the cause and effect of our actions in this quadrant. This is very much um, where we start seeing um, in a sense, we could say the implications of our actions, our thoughts, and our behaviors. And if we're endeavoring to evolve from, um, a, from a sincere place, this can be a very useful house. So it prepares us for the fourth quadrant, right? Which is awareness of and integrating into society. Um, so using what we've learned, we are now armed to interface with society to guide others uh, for the greater whole or to actualize our ideals for the greater whole or a collective, and we prepare to begin anew. So regardless of one's chronological age, as I was saying earlier, it seems that this progression does seem to work best if followed in an orderly fashion. We can't necessarily integrate into society in the most ideal way that would be mo where we'd feel most satisfied and happy if we're unaware of our awareness of self. If we don't know, say, like in the first house, how we're instinctually operating, or in the second house, what matters most to us, you know, or in the third house, how we best communicate and how we feel comfortable communicating, or where we need to learn how to um, challenge, you know, uh, where we need to challenge ourselves so that we're communicating at our best. Like if you say, like myself, have Saturn in the third house. Um, and so, yeah, again, how many times can I say it? But each quadrant's quality and each house's quality, right? It's all equally as important. And so let's see. Um, so now I, I have a few minutes, um, but I just want to check in real quick. Does anyone want to jump in with a comment or question before I start looking at charts? Okie dokie. Jump in anytime if you feel you want to. 
So uh, here, reconciling the challenges presented when planets and signs fall into unfamiliar or quote unquote incompatible houses. And so I said sometimes, but actually it's more like invariably, we're gonna come across charts with mutable planets and angular houses or fixed planets and cadent houses and so on. So how can this affect the expression of these planets? What kind of challenges and benefits ex exist? How can we min-max, as we would say in the gaming world, which is basically like, you know, making the best of the situation at like the absolute best of the situation, minimize our shortcomings, maximize our qualities. So I'm going to look at my chart briefly here and we'll see how, or at least what I've come up with so far. So this is my chart. And as you'll notice, we'll focus on the inner planets mainly. So they're the red planets here. But I've got a cardinal planet in a cadent house. I've got two more cardinal planets in cadent houses. I've got a fixed planet in a cardinal house. And I have a cardinal planet in a fixed house. So as someone with these kinds of placements, I've learned that uh, when I attempt to express my planetary energies, it could be a little confounding at times, we could say. Um, for instance, let's start off with Mercury and Capricorn in, in the Virgo house. Now, you could look at this and, and look at the benefits, right? It's an Earth house and, or Earth planet in an Earth house, right? Although, and the planet itself, Mercury is also exalted and ruled by Virgo, so that's, that's all good, right? But what do we know about Capricorn and its cardinalness? Well, um, it doesn't necessarily, although it is a planet that being cardinal, um, for a cardinal planet, it's, you know, it, it's built to adapt. It's built to adapt to society and, and responsibilities and the limitations placed on it by Saturn. But it doesn't necessarily like being positioned in Virgo in such a way where, well, it wants to be the boss. It doesn't want to be the one filing paperwork, <laughs> you know? Um, and so the way we could look at Mercury operating here, it, it needs to adjust a little bit in a cadent house. It, with with a, a Mercury, Mercury in Capricorn 2, can definitely get stuck in our ways and get dogmatic, right? Sag is a bit dogmatic, but you know, that's one thing we have in common, is we can definitely be dogmatic especially if we think we know what's right. And so adjustment needs to be learned for us to learn actually how to be more flexible. Cardinal's not comfortable being flexible. Remember, it wants to always go straight. And so living in this house can be really frustrating, especially because with a sixth house with Virgo, it's a bit of an underdog house, right? Um, we can experience disillusionments, disillusionments similar to Pisces, but more in the mundane world, right? Where he might be the last picked for the sports team or something like that, right? And uh, even though, or maybe, um, as an example, as a child, um, I used to always win academic excellence awards, right? Like I was a child genius, and then one year I didn't win them. <laughs> and I was like, what? I'm the smartest. What's going on here, right? But I had to learn that, like, that's life. There's always going to be someone smarter than you, right? You need to learn how to adapt, and you also need to learn how to be freaking humble, which is something that really helps Capricorn, but it's not always intrinsic to Capricorn energy to know that. So this house, although it can be challenging and confounding and frustrating to somebody who's not paying attention to the world, not paying attention to God or higher truths, right? Um, what can end up happening is um, if we're sincerely endeavoring, we can, we can learn how to adjust, but if we're not paying attention, we can become very bitter in this particular scenario. And I'm speaking from personal experience, of course, right? Um, and um, let's see. So yeah, it's about, although I would never be necessarily as adaptable as say a Virgo Mercury in here, I am learning how to take that forward moving motion and adjust my angles, even though it's not as quick or as adaptive as Virgo, I'm learning how to curve, which is great because Earth, Cardin or cardinal earth can get so stuck in a box, can become such a square, right? So this helps, it helps to learn to adapt through humility and also um, through understanding that, um, that to reach a pinnacle, you know, we sometimes need to start at the very bottom. Um, yeah. And so I, yeah, I think we're running out of time, hey? 
No, no, I had a question. Um, oh, hi, Wanda. Yeah, what's up? You think maybe um, because it, since you have Leo on the ascendant, this is basically a trying chart. So, and with the sun in that sun and Mercury um, in the sixth, maybe your, the lesson here is to learn to become a leader instead of a boss. That's oh, yeah. Things. I think you're spot on about that too, Wanda. And and the best way to be a leader too is just to definitely like with with that ascendant there, you know, is to learn like Leo um, energy, especially the environment I grew up in. And you'll notice the trine with um, with the moon and Aries. And I don't have Lucifer here, but Lucifer is also in a zero degree trine with that moon. With that, with those energies being placed there, oh my God, man, I think I'm the best. I think I'm better than everybody. And it gets so incredulous if, you know, um, if I'm shown up. And so, like, learning how to be a real, like, a, a, a good leader, oh boy, you know, I think that's my whole life karma. <laughs> like, not yeah. like a, a dictator, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, a, le a leader listens to their subordinates. A boss doesn't. Exactly. I think, I think that's probably what that um, Sun Mercury um, in that six house is probably. Uh, and and with the Leo ascendant, you're learning how to do that Leo because Leo can come from that same, you know, doesn't want to listen to anybody. Yep. Uh, so you're learning to do it in a new way. Totally. It's, it, I, I completely agree, Wanda. Thanks for that, adding that in too. And that actually brings me to a good segue because I think we're almost out of time. So I just want to segue into just all of our charts are perfect for us, you know? So even though I look at this and I see, you know, I've got cardinal planets in a mutable house, which can be a little confounding. Like I was saying, when you look at that rock, paper, scissors scenario I was talking about, it can be a bit confounding. We want to move straight, but we got to learn how to adapt. Our charts are made perf like depict or reflect our karma and our situation and our life experience perfectly. Because you're right, Wanda, that's totally true. I need to learn. Oh, and this is so true. Oh my God, Aries Moon. I need to learn how to listen. You know. Um, and so again, we. I, I don't really have the time, but with the Cardinal Moon up there in that mutable house, it's another area where it's it's about learning. Um, learning how to be flexible, learning how to be mutable, even though I, will, I am intrinsically cardinal, in a sense. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I think that's all I have for today. So I'm going to end it there because, am I correct, Linda, we're at, at time now? Well, a few more minutes. You can take five minutes if you like. Oh, great. Okay. I'll look into Canada briefly here. Well, actually, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> but um but yeah, it's when we look at our charts, it's so um, so important for us to understand that uh, you know it's we're not being dealt a, a a poor lot in life, and and when we see frustrations or challenges, um, it's not so much to punish us or that we're unfortunate. We're actually built perfectly to be the perfect iteration of who we are. And although consensus reality can be a challenge at this state in human development. Um, the more we examine ourselves and study ourselves, and like I was saying, we really get to examine and thoroughly understand all the houses in our charts, even if we don't have planets in them, you know? Um, the more that we examine these things and come to understand ourselves and how we function and even how the arenas of our life are being experienced by us, um, then the better armed we are to being able to be who we are. And to forgive ourselves, and definitely also, too, to forgive other people, because that's a big one. That is such a big one. Sometimes we can get really frustrated and project our frustrations out into the world and onto our family or society or, um, I don't know, why is this coming up? This is so embarrassing. Why is all this stuff coming? That guy in, in junior high at the dance who didn't want to dance with you. <laughs> Right. Um, if we're just coming back into ourselves to learn um, about who we are, we really can reconcile who we are as we relate to the world. We can find our place in the world and really feel like we fit here without needing anything as an external source to validate us. Because at the end of the day, it's never going to be adequate anyway. Right. Um, and um, 
yeah, I, I'll leave it there since we only have a very short amount of time. If anyone would like to, to jump in with a comment or a rude remark or a question, um, if we do have time for that, Linda, um, please, uh, anyone, go right ahead and step forth. Yes, the um, angular succedent and cadent houses. Um, so the angular would be, in terms of movement, angular would be very active. Perhaps that's why, you know, it's easily to be easily seen because of the activity. And then the succedent is very still. And the cadent is very changing. So it's still, there's movement and stillness both together. So I guess uh, Angular is more active and it's more able to be seen. What do you think? I think you're, you're absolutely right. And that might be why in more traditional forms of astrology it was seen as more important just because it was more prominent, no, more noticeable. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, not really. Well, yes, but um, the angles are, are very important because they are, oh gosh, getting a bit technical here but they from the angles the houses are then mm. calculated from the angles so astronomically it's 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 important that makes an, an complete sense of course because if you yeah if you don't even for instance um if you don't know a person's birth time you're not going to be able to calculate the angles and then you wouldn't have any of the rest of the houses either mm, exactly yeah. yep yeah exactly. I, I think i understand what you're saying now mm. Mm. That okay. makes complete sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry, please go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, and that, of course, is why Aries is, the, like, we could see Aries as the most important sign, because it is really the beginning, in a sense, right? Or the rest of the cardinal angles as well, because, I mean, who we are and how we interact with others and where our roots are and where we're actualizing ourselves in the world, that those are... I mean, it makes sense that those would be seen as the most important. I just wanted to iterate, reiterate in this um, too that, you know, uh, it's important for us to look at everything equally as well. But it does, there's no question, of course, that without the cardinal angles, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the houses. I mean, the angles come up heaps in, in tradition, traditional astrology. You know, mm -hmm. they, they are looked at first. They are considered, you know, the you need to look there first and um yeah i mean i think it'd be good to go into this a bit deeper and find out exactly why oh yeah we i think we could talk about this for hours <laughs> wendy go ahead wendy one thing i was thinking and um this is just kind of juxtaposed to what to the presentation but i loved your presentation sarah i have this book and it's about um a pre-patriarchal astrology and starting the wheel with Taurus. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is I'm thinking, you know, where does birth start, right? I mean, is it in the fourth house? I mean, Aries is uh, the, the newborn, but it's before the newborn. Where does that start, right? Where would you start that in the chart? Like, I don't know. It just makes me wonder if Aries is actually the initial point, ultimately. The, the initial beginning. Well, you bring up a really great point because the, the door to the cancer house to the fourth house, I mean, that's the deepest part of us, you know, like that, that goes right into our ancestry. So yeah. it, the root. So, I mean, where does a tree begin? You know, I mean, with right, all sorts right. of questions can come from this. That is very interesting. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for that. You think maybe during that time initiation was just kind of more important that they, they the initiation point i guess uh because all the all the cardinal houses are you know initiation so maybe that was seen as just way more important um even though they're really not because you can't just keep initiating 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 you know <laughs> that's where the the succeeding houses comes in to ground it to root it to give it a container and then the the uh, Caton houses makes the initiation and the container useful. So it's yeah, kind of like, yeah, bridge, I guess. Sorry, Wanda. I, I'm always I'm always quick to jump in. I apologize. Um, oh. I didn't interrupt you, did I? <laughs> no, no. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, what you're saying makes makes complete sense. I think that. Um, 
I mean, when it comes to an esoteric art science like this, the more that we examine it, I think the more we get to see, because really, if we look at natural principles like the law of correspondence, you know, this is really a reflection of what's going on inside of us. And the more we learn and ask questions, the more we can see different ways to interpret charts. I mean, there are so many different ways to interpret a chart and so many different schools of astrology that um, this bring, all of this brings up some really interesting questions. And I, I agree with Linda, we could go really deep into this. I've just got some little notes here from my first astrology teacher. 30 years ago, would you believe? <laughs> and uh, she says, the circle has been from the beginning of human symbolism, the symbol for the perfect whole. It has always meant completion, fullness and totality. In ancient times, the circle was used to symbolize the universe when all of being beings lay in a state of potentiality. So I'm thinking the uh, first house, the first ang angular house, is you know something coming into being as you said and the rest of all the other houses are the potentiality of the being what do you think that's pretty interesting too because you know it makes me as you were talking about that i started thinking about the pisces house and pisces i feel so much is like it, it's almost like the embryo just before birth or like you know, we're in that womb just about to be birthed it, I, now i'm <laughs> Now my mind's starting to get going because I'm starting to think of reading the chart from a reverse direction and everything. But yeah, um, that... Uh, I wanted to add something when you're done, so just before I go out, so... Yeah, please. Oh, I, when you guys are done talking, though, because I, I just want you to... I don't know if you could know that I want to say something, so I just want to let you know. Just I'm, say it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, jump right in. No, I'm thinking that the first house is the potential in the chart. Can you elaborate? Yeah, because it's the ascendant, and that's what your soul's intent is for this lifetime. However, the personality may get into the way. So for me, I think the first house is really like the ruler of that first house is soul's potential. That's just my what I'm believing in. But I mean, I think the whole chart is potential. I mean, everything is just seeds that need to come to fruition when they open up. But for me, as coming down to this incarnation, I mean, you know, I mean, who's to say that, like, you're right, depending on what you want to read into the chart, like, for if you're reading into the personality, you might look at the sun, right? But if you're looking at what the soul wants to do, it would be the first house. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And also that the circle is divided into four sectors and an expression of the dualism inherent in all of experience. And then to make this circle whole, which is the process of individuation. So, yeah, we could really go into this there. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we will then. Maybe we will at another time. That would be really fun. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there's just not one, you know. It's like who's on first, right? So it's like this is probably depending on what we want to look at, what we want to find out. That's what we, the planet we need to look to. Okay, Sarah, I think we would need to wind down now. And thank you, Lauren. And thanks, everyone, for your comments. Would you all please thank Sarah Peterson, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. That was fascinating. Thank you. Loved it. Loved it. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. It was great.